Hello guys, real estate broker Crystal Cox here. It's been quite a while since I've done a real estate video. The videos that I have out there in the real estate confessions and real estate industry whistleblower are all still relevant, I believe. We did have a market crash in a big way since I started real estate in 2000. Know this, the Association of Realtors, their chief economist, recommended you buy property even days, months, weeks before the crash. They knew that the real estate market was going to crash. Okay, mortgage brokers, home inspectors, title insurance companies, you name it. They are all connected, they're all marketed on the National Association of Realtors websites. They're all in associations and groups and, and a lot of industries are, okay? But what you want is something that is, let's just call it, try and work with people who are the absolute most independent, okay? Just because someone is a member of the Association of Realtors does not mean that they are more honest than someone who is not a member of the Association of Realtors. You can be a real estate broker and not be a member of the National Association of Realtors. The National Association of Realtors is what makes you a realtor. Okay, you can just be just. You can be a real estate broker and be you know, licensed by whatever state it is that you're working in. Um, I spoke with some folks once that had paid someone $25,000 in the prior year to be a real estate coach and that person wasn't licensed at all. So there's real estate coaches out there who are not licensed. It doesn't matter if someone goes to school for one week and gets a real estate license, uh, then they all of a sudden, because they know how to pass that test, that they should know everything there is to know about real estate and you put everything in their hands and you do it's shocking to me how many millions of dollars thousands hundreds of thousands people would spend based on what a real estate agent would tell them the real estate agent doesn't necessarily know everything there is to know about business about um, the economy and the Association of Realtors, as I said, pushed people to buy and they knew that the collapse was coming. I complained to the National Association of Realtors, I complained to my local boards, I complained to the top of the National Association of Realtors and there was nothing I could do to help the real estate consumer to protect them against NAR members who deliberately and knowingly lied to them. My e and insurance only protected me as a real estate company. It did not protect my consumer, which I had no idea when I first got into real estate. I convinced the broker that I first worked with to join multiple listing, to join the Association of Realtors, because I thought it meant there'd be more integrity, there'd be more accountability, more transparency. I was wrong. There wasn't. The real estate consumer has no rights. Now, I started in 2010, this is 16 years later, 2016, it's still the same, even after the crash. You have the National Association of Realtors that lobbies for things that are not of the highest and best interest of the real estate consumer. The Realtor.com website sells all kinds of things and they use your content to do it. Okay, They use your real estate listing, they use your photos, they use your water rights certificates, anything at all that's content local restaurants, you know, local resort areas, all of that becomes content to try to sell your property and really it is content that the National Association of Realtors uses on their website to sell things into infinity. Okay, Members pay to be part of the National Association of Realtors and it doesn't provide them any more protection. I can see you know, here in Washington State, where I now have my real estate company, Goddess Realty, you can join the multiple listing without joining the National Association of Realtors. In places like Montana, you can't. And that is an antitrust violation. You can't force a real estate broker to join a certain board, but they do. And there's been many antitrust lawsuits for that reason. 
there's been lawsuits so that people can use the MLS for a cheaper price to try to end the antitrust violations of the cartel known as the National Association of Realtors. I myself fought many years for buyer's rebates. When you join the Association of Realtors, I thought it was just like when you joined real estate or whatever, you, you got this, um, you could call and get legal questions answered. And I thought it was kind of a perk of real estate through the state, but it was a perk through the National Association of Realtors, which I learned later. I had many arguments and discussions and fights about the real estate consumer because I did not think it was fair that if I sold a piece of property and got a huge chunk of money for commission that I could not give any money back to um, someone who'd referred the listing or to a buyer. Okay, so say you you know you get both sides of a million dollar listing, you get sixty thousand dollars. They pretend that six percent is not standard. Six percent is standard. It is a violation of antitrust laws. You're not supposed to say it, but it's true. Anyway, um, <laughs> I lost my train of thought there. So. If I get 6% of a million, $60,000, right? And I want to give $20,000 back to the buyer so that they can, you know, get new carpet or whatever, do whatever they want, then that's more that was mortgage fraud, that was illegal, that was unethical, that was, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. And I was one of the ones who fought for years over this. And now it is legal to give a buyer's rebate. Your real estate broker may not be doing that, but it is legal to give a buyer's rebate, and they should be doing that. My first year in real estate, I just I jumped right in, and I give discounts. I you know I sold property for three, four, or five percent. I had local realtors going door to door saying that I was not giving the same kind of service that they were because I charged less. I was in the same MLS. I was giving better service. I was doing a lot more photos. I was giving more information. I was doing you know, things that, that hadn't been done before, which made them all mad. Um, for example, I'd have like 100 to 200 photos of a property. Because, you know, the, with the internet, you could do videos and slideshows and blogs and all kinds of things. They didn't like that because they'd take a, a listing, no matter how many millions of dollars the listing, how high end, how big the property, they'd only put like two to five pictures. And the reason for this is so that they can sell something. You know, they don't necessarily want to have to sell the property that is being listed. They just use your real estate listing and then they want someone to call and say, like, oh, well, if you're not interested in that, then maybe you're interested in this. Or force them to sign a buyer's agreement so that whatever they buy, they have to buy through them and they've used your real estate listing to bait them in to do that. Whether they sell your property or not becomes irrelevant. So I didn't think that that was fair. And so I would put tons and tons of photos. So then people would start demanding that of the other agents. Okay? And so then they would begin to put in more, more pictures. And that's just one example. Pictures do sell property, folks. I've sold multi-million dollar properties with pictures alone. And um, you want to get plenty of pictures. Give them plenty of things to look at to know that property. You know, to know anything like, like, trim you know in the house um, everything around the property everything around the house the chimneys the cabinets why not you know in all kinds of videos and, and these modern day videos with the drones and the and the weird virtual reality and stuff I don't I don't really like that um, I like to see a house from the street aspect and I don't really do drones but you know you marketing real estate without a real estate agent, you know, if you want to hire a drone to take videos and then give you that video for your website, that, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, most everybody has a cell phone now that takes photos. You could use a cell phone to market your property with nothing else. You need to start, you know, blogs for free. You know, people get the internet on their phone. Um, I use Blogger, and the reason I use Blogger is <laughs> something I like to say that Google loves itself okay so you use YouTube you use Google Docs you use blogs and you know Google photos and slideshows and all of that you can load up to YouTube and 
when people search in Google to find you, Google, I say that Google tends to prefer their own sites and tends to rank them better and optimize them better and it just works out better for whatever it is that you're trying to market. So I would get a dot blog spot for free and I would have the name of the address, the town on top. I do blog posts talking about, you know, the kitchen. Okay, everything in the kitchen and slideshow of the kitchen. Uh, talk about every room in the house and put a little slideshow. And you might say you don't have time to do this. The thing is, is that with that much money that you're giving the real estate agent, you you should be able to take the time to do it. And, and besides just the commission, you have future possible lawsuits. You have, um, anyway, I'm getting off topic. Let's talk this is about marketing right now you know get a Google account separate than your regular Google account and get Google Docs and do a write-up about the property and this says share usually in the upper right of Google Docs share that with the public um, then publish it on you put pick file and then publish it on the web and then that goes out and it's in the search engines and you can add to that document all the time talk about you know local resorts you can talk about local real estate local um, fishing you know any recreation anything beautiful you know put photos just can be a living document and when people find it they can read whatever's on it at that time and kind of selling your area your community and the house along with that and then linking to a blog that's free Google Docs is free and on the blog you know have lots of photos have blog posts for each room like say if you have a blog post that says living room kitchen you know yard then on the side you can have a word for each one of those living room kitchen you know and you don't even really have to get a website you can just link to each blog post that has the information about that the more you put on there the less you have people calling you wanting to look that don't end up wanting to buy it Now, real estate agents don't want to do that because they they want the people to call them so that they can try to get a client. You don't really want people to call you unless they're actually interested in the house. Now, I know this sounds weird, but the more that you show them about the house, the more they can be not interested if they're not going to be interested. You know what I mean? Um, or describing the area. You know, if you live across from a, a cattle ranch, they might not want to live across from a cattle ranch. Okay, the more details that you tell them, um, It'll either appeal to them or it won't, and it'll cut down, as I said, on your what we call looky loos. So, you can, um, I, don't, I don't recommend paying for internet advertising, like AdSense, or paying to get on top of the search engines, or, you know, buyers are looking for real estate. They're looking. Okay, they don't necessarily, you don't, and you can, you can list in the MLS for a flat fee in, in most areas now. So you could do that if you wanted and then link to the blog um, instead of the whole 8% and the whole thing with that. But you can also, um, you know, listing in the local paper, in the classifieds, the old fashioned way, and on notice boards in town and on Craigslist, people are looking there for real estate. So put a few pictures and then put a link to your blog that has tons and tons of information. That's all you need to do and all this stuff is free because the buyers are actually looking and, and you might think oh the real estate agent gets them qualified for a loan and does this and does that and no no really I found out in real estate that the title company does all the work okay I as the real estate broker made you know whatever percentage I charged and on average standard is six percent though they say that's an antitrust violation if you say it that's what they all charged and so, um, you know, I, I would make that money and the title company, the gals at the title company did all the work and they, I don't even know what they made per hour, but they did pretty much everything it took to close the deal. So you just, you know, you get your buy sell paperwork. You don't necessarily need a real estate agent to do forms. You could get a real estate attorney to draft it up for you. Certainly using an attorney is safer than using a real estate agent. Um, because real estate agents don't really know real estate law. Okay, some might, but we're not really taught that. And even if, you know, it's on the test, it's like, you know, it's not an everyday thing. 
um, to know all of that. So having a real estate attorney look it over might be prudent. You know, um, a real estate consultant look over your transaction. That too might be prudent. So the title company looks for liens on the property. Okay, they do um, all the closing documents. They do, uh, you know, they know the laws, RESPA law, all the, all the different things that you need to do. So the title company works, you know, they'll connect with the surveyors and they'll connect with the mortgage brokers and they'll connect with the real estate agents on both sides. And they're like the magicians to all of this, okay? But the real estate agent really gets the bulk of the money. So you want to pick a title company in your area, and I like to pick ones that aren't chains, and I like to pick usually the county, you know, whatever county you're in, and then title company. And just ask them to help you to do your real estate closing, and they will. The people at the title company are the nicest, most honest, most forthright people, forthright people that I ever worked with in real estate. Now, keep in mind, um, like I did not have a good experience with the chains, you know, like First American, and they tend to favor the other chains. Okay, so and if they've worked with it, an agent uh, or franchise, they tend to favor them over the independents, you know, and instead of taking care of the real estate consumer, um, it j you get to pick the title company. It is a violation of RESPA laws for them to force the title company on you. Just so you know that. The seller might end up working with a title company um, because the realtor always did and oh they did so much work so I'm going to work with them. You don't have to seller. You can pick whatever title company you want and the buyer can come along and say hey I want so and so title company. Oh but we've used First American and we want to continue them because they no that's the seller violating RESPA laws and forcing that on you. Um, happened to me time and time again in real estate in Montana. Namely Century 21's collaboration with First American Title. Um, so I recommend real estate consultant. I recommend you selling real estate on your own, uh, running your paperwork by a real estate attorney, which the independent uh, title companies, a lot of them have their own attorneys. So they're looking over everything. You don't really need to add a 6% um, real estate broker in the mix. You just, you really just don't even need them. Okay. Um, do a video you know, depending on if you feel comfortable or not, but you know, the more videos you do about the property, the more you can, you know, get them into YouTube and title them for the search terms that you want to come up. You know, like your town real estate or for sub by owner your town or whatever. And um, if you want to have a real estate agent list your property, make sure that they do what you want them to do. Okay, don't don't just let them run you around. Okay. If you are a party to a contract, you can change anything you want on that contract. Now, the National Association of Realtors has their standard contracts. So they tend to try to force that on the client, the customer, the real estate buyer, the real estate seller. But anything that you don't like in it, just cross out an initial. You, it's not, the real estate have, the real estate agents have some sort of a special deal where they're like acting like a lawyer in this in their contract with you. So, but it's a contract between you, the buyer and the seller. Okay? Or if you have an employment contract between you and the real estate agent, you can cross out anything you want, change anything you want and initial it. You don't have to follow the guideline of, "Oh, well, that's standard. That's just standard." No, you can cross it out and change it however you like. It's a contract between you and that person. If you're a party to that contract, you can change it. Of course, all parties to the contract have to agree and initial and sign. But don't let them force the standard National Association of Realtors contracts on you. Okay? And if, you, if you're a listing agent, um, I recommend that you put in, which I did with all of my listing people, I said, if you sell the property, then I'll let you out of the contract. Okay? So you can do, there's all kinds of different agencies. So I would basically, you know, um, be in competition with them. I'd say, okay, well, if you find your own buyer, then you can just walk and you can close with the title company without me, you know, because I knew and they knew that I'm also using them as bait to get clients that I might sell something else. Okay, so if I find the buyer, I get the commission. If they find the buyer, they get the commission. If a buyer's agent finds it and works with me, then, then I get the commission and then I split however I choose to split. Okay, if I list something for 6%, I don't have to give the other side three. I, as a real estate broker, we get to independently choose these things.
Okay, this is not necessarily something that is standard either. Now, there's the real estate industry, just like any other industry, has a lot of corruption, a lot of cartels, a lot of nepotism, a lot of you know insider stuff, a lot of conflicts of interest, and it basically all comes down to your gut feeling. Okay, don't let them push you around. Don't let them tell you you can't get out of a real estate contract. Okay. So if you sign a real estate contract, for example, for $250,000 for your house, okay, and then you're like, ah, I decided I didn't want to sell. Okay, so the real estate agent's like, oh, no problem. You don't need to sell. Uh, but you have to give us our commission, you know, or let, let it run out. Or say they get a $250,000 offer and you say, well, I don't want to sell. Okay, well, they've brought you a ready, willing, and able buyer at the price you wanted, so you have to pay them commission or you have to sell. They can sue you for commission because you're under contract with them. Okay, so I like to advise sellers to um, put this in their original contract. You know, you can write in, if I change my mind for any reason, you know, or I can cancel this contract at any reason. I don't have to go the full three months. I don't have to go the full six months. You know, you want to make sure that you write in every single thing that you want in that contract. You don't have to be, again, you don't have to be forced to this, these standard, oh, well, that's standard. That's not true. And if you want to run your real estate contract by a lawyer and have a lawyer draft up something different, then do that. You know, the real estate agent, I was so shocked in the beginning. It's like, we go to school for one week. They teach us how to pass the test. And then we... The public thinks we know real estate law and business law and everything there is to know about what's of their best interest, okay? We're supposed to know about plumbing and electric and everything that might hurt them and everything that might be in the wall and all of this stuff. And all we're really taught is how to take the test, okay? Um, for me, 17 years later almost now, yeah, I know a lot of stuff, okay? I knew a lot of stuff the first few years, a ton of stuff five years, you know, because I did all the different things, you know, I developed housing projects and I owned, you know, restaurants, and I sold hotels, and I sold agricultural, and I, you know, got sued, and I helped people to understand when to sue and not to sue, and and had clients that, that did sue different parties, and I've, you know, seen, you know, engineered forensics, and just everything that it takes to, well, to be honest, to try to get your money back. Uh, as you can remember in a previous videos that I've done, you, I don't want to say you're screwed, but <laughs> once you sign at the title company, it's over, okay? It's over for you. You own the property. If you go to the property and the floor falls out, there's nothing you can do. You may think you have recourse and you may think that you can have lawsuits, but you better have some money. If you've spent all of your money getting your loan and getting into the property and moving there and you have no wiggle room at all, you know, maybe you can get an attorney to take it on contingency, but then still you have massive stress. And if someone who built the house is a local, you, you know, you're going to get, you know, not hated, but you're going to get a lot of, you know, you're not going to feel very comfortable in the community. So it's important to know everything you can before you sign. And, and I'll talk about that more in, in videos specifically for buyers. But you need to know every single thing as a buyer before that you possibly can, not necessarily before you sign your offer, because you can have a lot of contingencies, but before you sign the closing papers at the title company, know everything that you can know. Okay. Now as a seller, you need to know your rights before you sign the listing agreement. Okay. You need to know what's your right if you change your mind. What's your right if you don't like the agent? If the agent just just signs the listing and does nothing to sell it and you want to switch agents, can you? What are your rights? Can you put that in there? Um, is there some sort of a listing agent rebate? Is there some sort of seller's discount or seller's rebate? Or it, what if you bring a buyer? Or, you know, discuss these things. You have rights. It's not ironclad set in stone. You are a party to the contract and you can change that contract to anything that you want that contract to be. Okay, a lot of real estate agents like to bully you once you've signed. And also on that note, um, this is kind of for buyers and sellers, I recommend buying property with a listing agent. 
And the reason I recommend buying property with a listing agent is because the listing agent knows more about the property and also there's less liability. I have had many, many examples of the same exact thing where, say, a property's on the market for years um, or whatever amount of time, and then I bring a buyer, I fax the offer to Century 21, and some agent at their office interferes. So they've sold the property before, or not sold it, but shown it. And so they, they interfere. They're like, oh my gosh, this person's offering. And, this person... and so then they get other buyers in the mix. Okay? Whereas if I was working with the listing agent, you know, if I was a buyer and I'm working with the listing agent, I'm not going to have to fax it. Other agents in the office aren't going to see it. There's not going to be all that. I'm going to get that, and I'm going to go right to my seller, and I'm going to present the deal. Okay? So it's easier to get an offer through when you're a buyer and dealing with the listing agent. A lot of folks like to say that it's not fair and that you will be harmed if you work with the listing agent because they get both sides of the money so they have a more of an incentive to close the deal and it's not fair to the consumers. Now, to me, this is a whiny argument that buyer's agents say because they can't list property. And I don't mean to say it like that, okay? I don't mean to sound negative, but it is not in the best interest of the consumer. Okay, so I gave you the example of people interfering, okay? Another example is I try to show the property. So I'm calling and I'm trying to show the property. Listing agent's not available. Listing agent's not available. Now, nowadays, they have the electronic keys, okay? So you can call the office and set it up. You don't even need to deal with the listing agent, right? Well, what's that about? So the secretary in the office sets up the appointment, the sellers leave the property, and then you can show it, and you just have your electronic key. Okay, so the seller's seen the property, the seller knows the stuff about the property, and um, but you're seeing it with a buyer's agent that doesn't really have any information at all. Okay, so it's easier to set up a showing when you go right to the listing agent, because they have contact with their seller. Okay.